Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, lecture series for actually two entities tonight, the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University and the School of Architecture at University of Detroit Mercy. And I'd like to acknowledge that there are numerous faculty and, and students from, uh, from uh, Detroit Mercy uh, represented by their dean tonight, Will Wittig. So, Will? Any, any UDM students, hold up your hands. Don't ask that. Don't ask, don't tell, don't pursue. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, now, just to let you know here, we have uh, some lectures still coming up this semester. Uh, everyone take out their calendars and, and, and put these in it. Uh, uh, Lois uh, Weinthal uh, will be here on March 21st. Uh, then um, we're really excited to, uh, that the a current AIA president, Mickey Jacobs, will be, uh, it's also a co-sponsored lecture between UDM and, and us. Uh, he will be speaking at UDM on uh, April 3rd. And then he will be holding a, a, day, uh, a workshop during the day here on April 4th. More information will be forthcoming uh, for you, but he's the current AIA president and also a, a graduate of University of Detroit Mercy, may I add. Um, then on April 18th, uh, we will have Tom Main here. And, um, and also that is the night of our AIAS uh, auction that will be taking place in the, uh, in the gallery. Uh, so everyone planned to attend uh, one or both of those, uh, those activities. A couple of other announcements for those of you that are AIA members or licensed architects. So uh, AIA continuing education credits are available uh, for you. And there's a sign up list on the podium just outside of the door. And with that, all those uh, preambles stated, I would like to call on our host for the night, uh, uh, Professor Edward Orlowski, uh, to introduce our speaker. Uh, tonight's speaker, Teddy Cruz, was born in Guatemala City. He obtained a master's degree in design studies at Harvard University in 1997 and established his research-based architecture practice at Studio Teddy Cruz in San Diego, California in 2000. He's been recognized internationally for his urban research of the Tijuana-San Diego border. In 1991, he received the prestigious Rome Prize in Architecture, and in 2005, he was the first recipient of the James Sterling Memorial Lecture on the City Prize. His work has been profiled in important publications, including the New York Times, Domus, and Harvard Design Magazine. In 2008, he represented the, represented the United States in the Venice Architectural Biennale. And in 2010, his work was included in Small Scale Big Change, an exhibition at MoMA. In 2011, Mr. Cruz was a recipient of the Ford Foundation Visionaries Award, the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture by the French National Museum of Architecture, and was named one of the 50 most influential designers in America by Fast Company Magazine. He had a big year that year. <laughs> he is currently a professor uh, in public culture and urbanism in the visual arts department at the University of California, San Diego, where he co-founded the Center for Urban Ecologies. One of the industry's most respected voices on public engagement strategies, Teddy Cruz is a tireless advocate, designer, and urban theorist. His work urges us all to think beyond traditional borders and to reconsider current politics of surveillance, immigration and labor, density and sprawl, and the expanding gap between wealth and poverty. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Teddy Cruz. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to come back to Detroit. I haven't been here in, uh, in a long, long time, and unfortunately it's a rushed visit. But I'm glad to come here and, and share primarily with the students, obviously, and with the rest of the faculty, some of the thinking, and obviously the images that I, I bring here to share with you. Primarily in, in, in maybe a, a kind of summary of the, of the last years, I decided to really uh, include maybe some of the most important points, the mo most important tenets, or maybe mini manifestos, if I can call it, of the many issues that really uh, emerged uh, in the last years that really prompted me to transform my architectural practice, or at least to challenge the very procedures uh, that we as architects obviously are trained to engage, but located in this uh, fantastic and convoluted and contested uh, uh, border that I occupy uh, through my work and, and, and living there. 
uh, it's been a very interesting process. So I want to primarily share, again, a variety of issues um, that hopefully should be provocative enough to uh, engage a conversation. Maybe after the lecture, I don't know if there might be time. Um, but uh, I wanted to begin, and I don't, is the microphone uh, OK? Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, I wanted to begin uh, probably with the obvious, and because many times I reflect on this, that the obvious has been staring us on the face, and we seem unable to engage it. Uh, we seem unable at times to uh, um, for, uh, head on to really engage the very critical issues that are redefining, in, in many ways, many institutions. And by that I mean that it has been obvious uh, that in the last years, of the, ce the celebrated, I guess, uh, metropolitan explosion, metropolitan explosion of the last years of economic boom, also engendered, also uh, produced in tandem a drastic, a dramatic project of marginalization. I think it's already obvious that for every enclave of mega wealth across the world, also uh, we begin to witness the exacerbation of the production of slums uh, uh, everywhere. So this uh, urban asymmetry obviously is at the center of the very urban crisis and the crisis itself that we occupy today. And I wanted to begin briefly just to meditate, I guess, uh, brief, uh, on, on, on the meaning or the very meaning of the crisis. I've been interested, in fact, as many kind of uh, strands of interest in my practice of research, and not only building buildings, but really building positions and maybe other expanded models of practice that enable me to enter into these uh, hidden zones, let's say, of opportunity. One of them is the visualization of uh, the crisis itself, the visualization of the political processes embedded in those uh, conditions. So what uh, prompted the crisis today invited me at some point to visualize um, the uh, research project, I guess, of uh, two French economists, uh, Zichetti and Saez, who produced an amazingly compelling project that investigated inequality in the United States. And it uh, really is about confronting two lines, two lines that I, I really enjoy this, by the way, the kind of power of lines, <laughs> two lines that can be arbitrarily drawn sometimes, but mainly lines that really respond uh, to an analysis, to a kind of um, uh, critical historiography, let's say. I think that we need to re-engage the hidden histories, the forgotten histories that have been part of the socioeconomic uh, inequality of today. So these two lines, which in fact move, stretch, bend uh, across time, are of interest to me in the last years, uh, obviously in the last uh, couple of years as I discovered this research. Moving across time, uh, we can see two peaks, uh, one obviously in 1926, another one in 2006. It's obvious by now that every politician might begin a speech today in suggesting that today's economic downturn is very similar to the Great Depression. And as, a, as an immigrant in this country, I wanted to find out what that meant. Visually, this is very powerful. We see the peaks on those two moments uh, in a valley in between these two uh, lines. Obviously, this refers to the fact that at those two moments in recent history, we, we find the largest income inequality uh, in this country, and I would argue in the world for that matter. What is interesting, though, is that the line that corresponds below it, almost mirroring those two peaks and that valley, respond to, in fact, uh, that at these very two moments, we also find the lowest taxation on the wealthy. Obviously, this is maybe clear to many of you. Uh, this, to me, in a sense, surprised me because it really uh, ultimately um, reveals, in a sense, the hypocrisy of a trickle-down economic paradigm. The things that uh, uh, you know, we have to detax the wealthy in this country in order for us to really share in the profits. In a sense, for me, this has been a very powerful notion to really understand and critique the very notions of democracy and freedom in this country that somehow has, have perpetuated an idea of the American dream as the almighty right to be left alone. And I think that this correspondence of these two drastic moments of the gap really puts to rest what produced the crisis in the first place. Now, obviously, while we all agree with the obviousness of this statement and these images, uh, which, by the way, I do, I, even though it's obvious, this story for me was fundamental. But what I began to notice is that while those two peaks are obvious, we never really talk about the valley in between. 
And to me, this became a revelation in the last uh, couple of years to suggest that right after the Great Depression, by that I mean that uh, the conditions of today are very different, in fact, from uh, the years of after the Great Depression in general. I'm not a historian, but nevertheless, I'm very interested in more impressionistic way of thinking about this. It is obvious that already after the Great Depression, we have the emergence of the Bill of Rights by FDR, uh, which ultimately paved the way for the New Deal that by already uh, the er late uh, uh, 30s, uh, mid 30s, we begin to see a fundamental reorganization of the institutions in this country by which civic philanthropy, government, and civil society seemingly come together to engage the possibilities of public investment, not of public disinvestment, uh, but in fact, a, a forward a kind of progressive idea about investing in infrastructure, public, for, uh, obviously, uh, through the uh, WPA, uh, uh, Works Progress Am Administration, uh, that really invested infrastructure at top-down and bottom-up levels, public housing, public parks, public health. In fact, public was not a forbidden word from our political language. And that, to me, was essential to understand. You can see how the taxation and the kind of, uh, you can argue, even though, and I don't want to get into this, and I have to keep my time, uh, because I have many stories to tell you. But uh, I know that some of you there in the audience, uh, from uh, more accurate uh, uh, reflections on history, might argue that also in this period is when we uh, see the emergence of uh, the type of oil-hungry urbanization uh, that really paved the way to the crisis today. But nevertheless, Yes, even though we all know that the top-down public project that informed this possibility was faulty in many ways, nevertheless, there was a comprehensive investment in a sort of engaging of a collective imagination. Uh, for me, that's a point of departure because obviously the crisis today has been uh, uh, amplified by a huge division, a gap between urban policy and the public's imagination, or a civic imagination. This is what I've been reflecting recently and suggesting that while we are all uh, uh, cognizant of the implications of global warming, we cannot only reduce the crisis to be seemingly only an environmental crisis or an economic crisis alone. I would like to present it primarily as a cultural crisis, a crisis, in fact, of the institutions themselves, unable to rethink their own protocols, from schools of architecture to governance uh, and to communities. And in that sense, I think uh, we are unable to rethink the way, and I could say the stupid ways by which we've been growing in the last decades. Obviously, it has really hit us on the face, how would you call it? I don't want to say a bad word here, but uh, it's obvious that by now we recognize that these stupid ways of growing have become unsustainable. What I've been reflecting also is that not only this is obvious, but uh, at the same time I'm worried that while this is the problem, the real problem, in fact, is the way by which we think, by this sort of production of icons of stupidity, we think that we are solving the problem. The problem is the way we think we are solving the problem. Uh, in a sense, uh, I am critical of the, the kind of, I don't have to call soft alterations of the system, but I'm interested in suggesting that no advances in sustainability and its cliches could be achieved today without challenging the very politics and economics of growth the very politics and economics that have enabled and endorsed, ultimately, that urbanization and steroids. What role do, do architects have, obviously, in challenging that? I argue, and I, maybe I'm fast forwarding the tape because uh, all of a sudden comes to me, that besides designing buildings, obviously our task disciplinarily, we also need to design political and economic process today. And that's really the, the opportunity of architects, since we are so masochistic. Uh, in a sense, this inability, ultimately, to rethink the logics of growth and to understand as well that the crisis was perpetuated by institutions of exclusion that polarized the enclaves of mega wealth as the so-called global city that was so much revered by architects in the last years, 
uh, but without noticing that ob obviously that produced, as I mentioned earlier, a dramatic project of marginalization. In fact, a time when the neoconservative policies and economics of development began to camouflage uh, privatization as public. Uh, I am interested in demolishing, in fact, those notions, meaning that when FDR will not come back anytime soon, I always thought that Obama might be an opportunity, but as we see, has been locked into a kind of uh, strange environment at this moment. Since FDR will not come uh, uh, back anytime soon, or an idea of a top-down public uh, is very questionable today as the welfare state, obviously as emblematized by the crisis in Greece, Spain, and, and, and Italy, uh, the welfare state is also questionable in our time. Where is the public today? That's a fundamental question. We need to rethink it. Maybe it's not a top-down pro, uh, public project. Maybe it's distributed across other jurisdictions, other types of histories or communities. I've been also uh, thinking that one of the most amazing moments, I think, at least in my mind, in the context of the civil rights mo movement, uh, denouncing a bit this sort of strangeness of our idea of the public, uh, is when that uh, uh, activist, uh, Rosa Parks, uh, Park, uh, sat in the seat where she did not belong. You can argue that that seat was public that the boss, according to the institutions, then was public, but obviously it was uh, inaccessible to, uh, uh, it was not accessible to everyone. So I'm, uh, th I've been thinking a lot about the necessity to move from our neutrality, uh, our ideas of the public, uh, our neutral uh, notion of the public. I'm saying this also within the School of Architecture, where we think that just by designing a beautiful place, we can uh, assure accessibility uh, and social access and mobility, uh, while in reality we have only been dealing with the beautification of space and not its social and economic uh, uh, um, uh, maintenance, let's say, for a moment. So the, the need to move from the neutrality of the public to the very specificity of rights is an important issue. In that context, in my practice, I've been uh, meditating about the need, obviously, because I occupy a very contested zone in this border territory, which, by the way, might not that be foreign to you all here in Detroit, because obviously the kinds of contestations in the territory across institutions uh, is reproduced everywhere. In cities like Detroit, it's also amplified. Geographies of conflict. How do we enter in the recognition of the specificity of the political inscribed in this radical location? localities. The radicalization of the local for me was essential at some point in my own territory in order to expose, to visualize many of those conflicts, to understand the specificity, obviously, of the political economies of division. So this is an image uh, in introducing a little bit more into the territory where I uh, live and work, which is the border, obviously, between uh, San Diego to the north and Tijuana to the south, and this sort of reversed uh, figure ground drawing where the white uh, it represents buildings and black uh, empty space just to dramatize the way Tijuana crashes against the wall. And you can see the blue line, which is the uh, Tijuana River as it, uh, the Colorado River descends at, uh, towards the border, transforms into the Alamar River, enters into Mexico, and then exits back into San Diego across this Tijuana River estuary and, uh, before it ends in the Pacific Ocean. So this obviously has been a series of juxtaposition uh, between the political and the natural, but uh, in the last years I've been interested obviously not only on the border itself, I uh, whether as a metaphor, uh, as a thing or as a territory, but more in the transversal, invisible trajectories where that wall is reproduced in infinitely in the kind of collisions across ecologies. So I produced this piece a few years ago, uh, commissioned by the uh, architecture uh, Venice Biennale to be installed on the facade of the US pavilion, an amazing opportunity. So I thought, why not to bring this image of a 60 linear miles of transborder conflict narrative into that uh, place? Uh, basically, it talks about a very simple exercise I gave myself. Uh, what would happen if I was to photographically document 60 linear miles in sequence, uh, documenting places where I find the very dramatic collision between top-down forces of urbanization and bottom-up socioeconomic or natural uh, conditions, beginning 30 miles deep 
into San Diego, the conflict between top-down development and the topography as private developers have been flattening the differential of the topography in the edges of San Diego to install their cheap recipes of suburban uh, enclaves. Uh, this flattening of the topography produces this conflict, obviously. The conflict between large infrastructure of the watershed as the large freeway ecology descending from Los Angeles to Tijuana across the coastal cities also collides with the watershed systems, with the hydrology uh, uh, of the land as it descends towards the cities. The conflict between gated communities and everyday life, uh, obviously uh, Southern California is the epicenter uh, uh, of uh, an urbanization made of enclaves of division and so on. The conflict between military bases and environmental zones, the only places where the otherwise continuous urbanization from Los Angeles to Tijuana is interrupted is where we find these military bases in Southern California presenting this strange alliance between systems of militarization and control and urbanization, but that in turn are overlaid with environmental zones. Uh, the conflict between formal and informal urbanizations as older neighborhoods in San Diego we begin to transform in the hands of immigrants in the last decades. The conflict between two border cities, now when we reach the actual border wall, two border cities that ignore each other, that repel each other, that do not collaborate in shaping their own future. The conflict between river and border, as I mentioned earlier, when the actual Tijuana River collides almost tangentially with the border wall. And as we enter Tijuana, the conflict between informal settlements and the actual natural ecologies as also slums uh, come in conflict with the watershed systems. The conflict between factories in Tijuana, because Tijuana is a city of factories, becoming one of those uh, tax-free zones in the world, taking advantage of local cheap labors, necessitating again the uh, cheap labor from the slums. They place themselves in the midst of them. The conflict between density and sprawl, as developers in Tijuana now reproduce in miniature the Mac mansions of uh, San Diego uh, to produce social housing. And finally, at the other end of these 60 linear miles of transborder conflict, we find maybe the most dramatic of all of those junctures, which is that place where the border wall finally sinks into the Pacific Ocean. It is this image that I amplified. It's one of the most compelling sights uh, that uh, one can witness today as this uh, wall disappears into the water. And I juxtapose along that the panorama this horizon of local conflicts, suggesting that archi the architecture profession today, more than ever, needs to reposition itself in the midst of each of those collisions, retroactively as a kind of forensics of urbanization, trying to understand who is responsible, who are the stupid institutions that produce those collisions. Because those conditions can become the material for the designer today. And that's what I placed on, on the facade of the US pavilion, uh, barely a few uh, months before the Bush administration packed its bags. It was an amazing, in fact, opportunity to hand the border wall, one of the most uh, contested borders on the US pavilion as a threshold to enter the exhibition that really displayed practices of architecture uh, that dealt with these issues. Obviously, uh, while this is a virtual wall that enables the narrative to really be mobilized, I'm interested in the physicality of that wall, because when global conflict hits the ground, it obviously produces these artifacts that transform San Diego into the world's largest gated community. And obviously, the wall becomes emblematic of an an urban planning that has continued to depend on the fragmentation of the territory, the division of the territory into uh, uh, enclaves uh, uh, of separation, dividing communities and jurisdictions. And uh, one more maybe uh, incredibly sensationalist fact here is that when we look at the bookends of that cross-section, we can also say that at no other place in the world, one can find some of the wealthiest real estate as the one found in the edges of San Diego, barely 20 minutes away from some of the poorest settlements in Latin America. This radical proximity of wealth and poverty is what really begins to open up other procedures that we must engage as architects. Obviously, then, I am interested in the uh, practices of encroachment.
the very invisible flows from south to north, from north to south, across this formidable barrier, that really begin to be inspirations to rethink one's own practice. In fact, to rethink the political itself. I'm saying this because many students sometimes, many of us, uh, um, do not really are afraid at times of thinking of the political thinking that, it, that, that many students have told me is about being a politician, when in reality the political is a very different notion. Uh, to rethink the political for me here is suggests that uh, I begin to interpret the political as that a moment of collision between the top down and the bottom up. It is that moment uh, that yields the very notion of the political and begins to open up the potential of other ways of constructing city obviously other ways of constructing citizenship. Maybe here is not that relevant, or maybe yes, in today's uh, uh, kind of sadness when we have seemingly transformed from citizens to customers everywhere. But when I live next to Phoenix, uh, Arizona, it has become the epicenter of xenophobic anti-immigration policies. I need to uphold or a kind of present an idea of citizenship that really is about a creative act. It's not really a, only be, uh, having the documents that make you belong to the nation state. Citizenship in its very core is a creative act that reorganizes institutional protocols, uh, obviously the spaces themselves of the city, a political will to really transform the environment. So I've been trying to gather stories, narrativizations as an artist, I'm interested in the, the telling of stories through uh, documentaries of these uh, moments or these acts of alteration, of adaptation and retrofit by immigrants, but also teenagers in San Diego, California, uh, in Southern California. This story uh, is called The Chronology of an Invasion, and it speaks really of a map of empty spaces. When we erase the actual built environment and we only leave the archipelago uh, of uh, vacant zones or lots or sites, uh, we uh, get a very compelling image of division. Obviously, for many of us artists and beyond, uh, the empty space, the vacant uh, sites have become only instrument to imagine metaphorically a kind of poetics of intervention. But I've been interested in amplifying it as a political also, obviously, project because what has produced that archipelago of emptiness are really, again, strange types of uh, policies that divide uh, the territory. Uh, so there are certain typologies that I'm interested in San Diego, such as the junctures between freeways and neighborhoods. This is, let's say, one of those islands, which is actually near the neighborhood where I live, where I began to discover a, a kind of, uh, how would I call it, a, a story of a, in the hands of a group of teenagers that I began to interview uh, months after uh, they produced what I'm going to tell you. Basically, uh, one night, uh, they decided, uh, they organized themselves and decided because they did not have a a skateboard park in San Diego that could accommodate their activity, they decided to go to Home Depot and buy shovels uh, so that they en masse uh, uh, invaded this uh, leftover space. And, and this is uh, the more accurate dimension of that uh, no man's land when I went to the municipality to request the actual jurisdictional location of this empty site beneath the freeway that the teenagers appropriated. Two weeks later, the police stopped them uh, and and uh, basically, they uh, evicted them from the site. The teenagers got uh, pretty pissed. Uh, and then they decided to kind of fight back in a way and to organize themselves uh, 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 even uh, uh, deeper. And this is uh, the moment when I began to talk to them. And they told me something that uh, none of my students of architecture or art uh, have told me, really, is that the first thing that they did well, not only organizing themselves very cleverly, uh, but they began to question, they began to ask uh, basically the political jurisdiction uh, of that particular juncture. Who owns? Uh, whose territory is this? Uh, they said uh, to me that they had been lucky because they had not begun to dig under Caltrans territory. Caltrans is the state agency that owns the freeway. And as you know, in California, the freeway, probably in Detroit as well, here's where it was born, uh, is incredibly uh, pr uh, 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 monumental and uh, untouchable. Uh, they were lucky because they had begun to dig in an arm of the freeway that belonged to the local municipality. Therefore, uh, there was an opening 
uh, to ne for negotiation. They were lucky, they also said, because they had begun to dig in a kind of Bermuda Triangle of jurisdiction between Port Authority and Aeroport Authority, two city districts, and a review board corridor. <laughs> Obviously, all these red lines pertain to the institutional jurisdictional forces that define that empty space, and they were now uh, seeking to engage the political actors behind each of those institutions. So as a skaters, they organize themselves with that information, that knowledge, obviously, is the research that we all must engage in order to really be more intelligent about how to encroach into these uh, uh, policies. And they engage city officials, the city attorney, and the city council that finally took responsibility for this. Uh, they were advised that if they wanted to negotiate further, they had to become an NGO. And as an, uh, they didn't know what an NGO was, they had to really uh, ask uh, some uh, skateboarders uh, from Seattle uh, about their own process that had gone in similar uh, types of pro uh, procedures. I'm uh, mentioning this because the exchange of knowledge across activist practices, I think, is an important uh, part of this story. Uh, they then uh, organized themselves uh, as an NGO. They had to get uh, a lawyer, const a construction uh, uh, insurance budgets, organize themselves in investigating further the different departments of the city that were responsible in fragmenting budgets, uh, every permit recognizable in the code that had to do with temporary encroachment. The story is very large. All I'm trying to say is that the teenagers became the designers of a process by which they were untangling the complexity of those labyrinthine and at times opaque bureaucratic uh, conditions to be begin to consolidate budgets and to challenge the very definitions of open space. That was part, one aspect of the story that was really fantastic when they realized that the definition in the planning code of open space cannot be as neutral and as arbitrary uh, and that they needed to really amplify other categories of public space. They engaged the city, they uh, won the case. I wish I could tell you in more detail the other parts of the story, but out of a transference of liability, they were able to uh, get control of the space, uh, moving from the public, let's say, uh, to the semi-private, uh, uh, and they built their own skateboard park under that uh, freeway overpass. Uh, for me, again, this is a compelling story, as uh, naive and simplistic uh, that it might be to some of you, but I mean, uh, for me, it's an il illustrative case of how an act of transgression, an informal act of encroachment, can begin to trickle up to transform top-down policy and to reorganize institutional protocols. It also suggests, obviously, that conflict must be a creative tool, as this visualization of hidden processes uh, really uh, began to suggest, and that what forms our conditions or notions of community must also be more directed and more specific. What is community at the end of the day, since we just tend to throw it around so easily, including myself? Communities of practice are summoned by urgencies and by engaging these conflicts as well. The compelling questions of the teenagers, whose territory is this and who owns the resources, must be the first questions all of us engaging uh, projects in urbanization must ask. Because without understanding those conditions, our projects tend to really ultimately be as a mere camouflage with hyper aesthetics of the very problems we're trying to ultimately reorganize and transgress. So uh, the story of the teenagers presents to me, at least in my practice at some points, also the possibility of simultaneously not only designing the spaces, but really designing the protocols themselves, the simultaneity and interpenetration of space and protocols that can assure, again, the maintenance and the sustainability socioeconomically of the spaces we are designing. Obviously, these tactics uh, of adaptation and retrofit belong to a kind of uh, long research that I've been developing at the San Diego Tijuana border that maybe some of you might be familiar with. I've been really visually and in many other ways documenting the flow of people going north and the uh, flow of waste going south in the last uh, years, uh, the transborder informal urbanizations that really are invisible uh, to the institutions of planning at the border, uh, the flow of waste uh, going from north to south in the shape of urban debris, such as these post-war bungalows, uh, small houses from the 50s that uh, began to be demolished at some point because developers began to build an inflated version of themselves in terms of these mansions everywhere. 
And these uh, small bungalows are given away to Mexican developers who either are get them for free, they transport them into Tijuana. These are houses waiting to cross the border. So not only people cross the border, but entire pieces of one city move to the next. When these houses enter into Tijuana, they are placed on top of these steel frames, leaving the first floor again to become the second, to be infilled with other narratives, other uses, other houses, businesses, and so on. This is a strange kind of, uh, I call it, club sandwich of urbanization. Uh, the fearless approximation of opposites begin to suggest something a lot more complex in terms of alternative categories of land use. Uh, houses but also rubber tires uh, that are now are imported into Tijuana but while many of you might have seen uh, these tires uh, used in particular ways, look at what people have now figured out in conditions of socioeconomic emergency. They have figured out how to move from the unit to the system, which might be the most paradigmatic uh, concept of contemporary uh, experimental ur urban theory, in a sense, uh, where one tire begins to thread with the rest to produce a more efficient, more functional, more operative retaining wall or the garage doors from Riverside and from San Diego, from Southern California that are uh, imported into Tijuana en masse uh, to build uh, social uh, emergency housing in many of these slums. Garage doors from the older subdivisions of San Diego now being retrofitted and reassembled into the new skins of these houses in many of the slums in Tijuana. Obviously, as architects, uh, we tend to romanticize the informal. I'm not going to negate that there is something powerful in looking at these images of bricolage. But I want to suggest that it is not the image of the informal or the aestheticization of the informal while it's at the stake today. I think the informal must be uh, forwarded as a praxis, uh, as a set of procedures, a social, political, uh, economic in nature. After all, I would say that in many ways of redefining our political language, I already suggested one about the political. Uh, one that could uh, redefine the informal is that the informal really is a set of procedures that transgress and challenge imposed political and economic recipes. And that engages into a set of actions, performative conditions and processes that we sometimes do not comprehend as architects. I've been interested in the translation and the interpretation of those procedures into new models uh, of urbanization, in a sense. But always entering into conflicts, what really is the conflict that I began to choose in Tijuana uh, that would enable me to understand this further? And it was really the conflict between factories, labor, and housing. As I began to realize that many of the maquiladoras or factories uh, that come from Japan, Asia, from uh, Korea, and so on, into Tijuana to take advantage of these uh, zones uh, of exception, let's say, in terms of economy, they place themselves in the middle of the slums so that they can borrow labor easily without giving anything in return. And I began to realize that instead of really rushing to the, to the slum, as any architect would do today, just to build housing for the poor, which is part of our, the paradigm I wanted to challenge. I'm, I'm critical of institutions of charity that only think that by building houses we are solving the problem. Yes, we must build houses, but in, this, in tandem, I think we should also be building communities. So I began to realize that I wanted to take a detour uh, from uh, going just for the problem solving and really begin to see other sites of intervention. Can the factory be a site of intervention where maybe we could begin to, again, take these detours and begin to suggest the alteration or the, uh, how would I call it, the, the engagement, more than anything, of the political economy of waste. This is what is at stake in Tijuana. Not only the bricolage, which is fundamental, because that's part of the sustainability of those communities, but that there is a political economy of the discarded that is really an, an interesting kind of uh, context. So obviously, uh, we enter into the factory, produce a model by which the sweat equity of people building their own housing in these uh, canyons that in a way become factories of housing, as they are also the labor of these maquiladoras. Can there be a process by which the maquiladoras, when they borrow labor, they can give something in return in the shape of their own material assembly lines uh, or, or uh, systems, and how we can then 
pair that with uh, government subsidies, engaging community activists in the very sweat, uh, the economy of sweat equity. Uh, this is a gross generalization. What I'm trying to suggest is that the project that became important for us was that architects uh, in this context not only could be the designers of systems, uh, physical systems, but the designers of new modes of collaboration across these polarizing entities. Uh, so we began to, we enter into the factory to produce a couple of case studies one that had to do with this metal, uh, very lightweight metal uh, frames that are weldless, that could be assembled uh, very easily by two people, uh, and we produce this prototype, which is really simply a kind of uh, space frame uh, that then can be retrofitted into the existing across a variety of systems and configurations. Uh, this sort of urbanization, ultimately, uh, of uh, adaptation. Uh, the most important one probably became the one that used the very literal pr uh, material of this factory. It's a Spanish maquiladora that produces these lightweight metal uh, pallet rack systems that are exported all over the world. Uh, so we thought of it as a possible hinge that could structure in more uh, sustaining ways the bricolage that ultimately is very precarious as in the first kind of rainy season a lot of damage is caused. So the idea of these uh, hinges uh, that could mediate across a variety again of recycling materials just like those uh, tire walls, can we do the same in stitching the garage doors, the houses, the other uh, materials into more coherent organizations? Uh, obviously because these slums are not going to disappear anytime soon, we decided let's in fact think of temporary transitional micro-infrastructures that can support the evolution from the temporal to the permanent. Uh, and that began to suggest a very interesting project uh, of rethinking, obviously, the very scale of infrastructure uh, in the context of the informal. Taking into account one of the most compelling uh, notions of infrastructure forwarded already years ago by Stan Allen, that uh, infrastructures are truly uh, uh, mediating systems uh, that negotiate the relationship of the formal and the informal of the top down and the bottom up and engage uh, the, the, uh, the, the, dy the temporal dynamics uh, suggesting uh, a very interesting transparency between the spatial and the social. In other words, infrastructures are anticipatory uh, of transformation. Um, in this context, I'm interested in that notion conceptually because what people do in these environments is what these theories are trying to talk about, is that uh, how do we again negotiate time, boundaries, space and resources. It's a huge com complex uh, set of procedures that are at play here. So while waste flows uh, southbound, I'm interested in the opposite flow primarily in my practice, which is the flow of people moving north to search for dollars. I'm talking about uh, the impact, and I should say the positive impact of immigrants in the transformation uh, of the American neighborhood. And that to me has been an essential uh, point of uh, research as I began to also collect stories but also collaborate with marginal neighborhoods and their nonprofit representation uh, in uh, the neighborhoods flanking the border uh, in Tijuana and San Diego. The non-conforming Buddha has been one of those emblematic stories among many, uh, which is really a story of a cross-border land use map. Imagine at the most trafficked border in the world, not one single shared land use uh, uh, policy exists between these two cities, so I had to splice it in very simple terms. I'm saying this and I know that I have to continue rushing through the material because I am sharing all these uh, pieces of the process, but I've been also critical of how uh, in, in schools of architecture uh, in the last years as the power of the diagram begins to really be an instrumental tool, nevertheless. Finally, we are trying to confront and face and, 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 and understand the, the complexity of, of, of the thickness, again, of that force field, which is the, uh, the city, but in the way by which we represent those conditions, we tend to produce very unaccessible images that are so dense uh, that are very seldom useful for politicians or activists. These are images for other architects, but not to engage in the kind of 
uh, amplification of the complex in very simple terms. So this image is one of those experiments. It's a very lyrical, simple image that splices the large chunks of color to the north. Obviously, the land use of separation between huge bedroom communities, slivers of retail in the shape of malls and so on in San Diego. And to the south, the high pixelation uh, of density in Tijuana, uh, again, a kind of more three-dimensional land use, uh, uh, this confetti, as I call it, of illegal alternative uses has begun to infiltrate itself into the largeness of Southern California. And when that confetti hits the ground, it begins to transform in many of those marginal neighborhoods, the older subdivisions, the kind of older kind of Southern California levy towns, begin to transform the homogeneity of those parcels that only allow one home per 5,000 square feet into uh, temporal alterations. Again, the kinds of socioeconomic contingencies, the informal uh, urbanizations of retrofit that transform into a garage, into a small economy, or a, an illegal granny flat is built behind an official house. I'm talking about this, uh, obviously, this informal densities and economies transforming these neighborhoods and these parcels. The informal Buddha, as a story emerges from here, is about a small house that saved itself, that did not really go in exile in Tijuana, but that was transformed in the end by a group of Buddhists who transformed it into a Buddhist temple uh, 25 years ago. And in doing so illegally, they produce out of this house an amazing agency that negotiates uh, with the rest of the neighborhood a, 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 an amazing amount of programming. I'm interested, in other words, in the role of these agencies on the ground, within communities, that begin to translate, interpret, bundle many of these entrepreneurial energies across economy, social organization, and cultural pedagogy. Uh, I'm interested in mediating agencies uh, that can really be the translators of those informal conditions uh, into new policies. And here's where architects come in. This is where I realized that I could plug into that system uh, to produce an interesting conversation, producing an interface between the specialized knowledge of us as architects and the creative intelligence of many of these communities and so on. Uh, this interface between institutions and communities is at stake today, I think, in redefining the public. Obviously, again, the production of a new political language that can mediate uh, these uh, possibilities. One particular one is the urgency to rethink density. I mean, let me take a break because I've been speaking too, too, too much, but what is density? Can somebody tell me uh, what is density? I mean, how would you conceive density in the institution here in the School of Architecture? Yes, so it is an amount of units per area, right? It is a, a, an incredibly indifferent and neutral and abstract equation that has perpetuated the problem across academia, governance, and development. And I began to realize the need to challenge this because this has, again, perpetuated the deployment of objects on the territory without any responsibility towards the public, towards infrastructure, etc. Uh, because in many of these neighborhoods, the equation would be different. That density could be measured as an amount of social exchanges per area. Obviously, for an anthropologist or a sociologist, that would be a huge challenge uh, to draw. How would we draw that exchange? And how would we represent the city differently? Uh, I'm speaking, what again is obvious, is what is the meaning of social and economic contingency into space. I'm not interested in the kind of morphogenetic processes by which form is uh, transformed through digital algorithmic models, which fine is part of what we have to do as architects in suggesting a kind of forward uh, a future in terms of aesthetics and design. But I'm interested more in the transformation of space by people and the contingency, again, of the political and the economic. How do we then speak of these possibilities uh, of alteration. In that sense, marginal neighborhoods then have become sites of production. I wanted to mention this as another one of these tenets in my mind and my practice. I began to realize that, the, uh, again, the glamorous ex uh, metropolitan explosion of the last years from Dubai to Shanghai, you call it, was defined by an urbanization of consumption supported by the iconographically rich, let's say, uh, work of architects that, 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 that hid, in a way, many of those conflicts. 
while that was occurring in the last years, it was marginal neighborhoods, marginal communities in formal sites that remain sites of production, uh, of culture, but also of socioeconomic uh, processes. I'm interested through that reflection in the rethinking of ownership, obviously, uh, between consumption and production. I, I think it's essential to confront those uh, paradigms in the context of the city. After all, the city was always the epicenter uh, of uh, production, in a sense. Uh, so one of the most compelling in my mind reflections for me had been not only in Tijuana, on the Tijuana side as an emblematic project, to take the detour to the factory, so the factory would be a site of intervention. But in San Diego, the, 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 uh, the uh, challenge was to intervene, in fact, in the developer's spreadsheet uh, as, a, uh, as a fundamental site to rethink resources and the policies that are uh, the exclusionary policies that produce the crisis in the first place. Could we inject into the developer's spreadsheet the informal economies I'm talking about, the kind of hidden value of sweat equity, of collaboration? Can we, in fact, inject into this spreadsheet other modes of political representation as these nonprofit organizations are inventive in their cross subsidy to hide and camouflage the invisible to really amplify their entrepreneurial logics? Can that be? A device. I'm saying, obviously, uh, something that for you might be clear is that we have been so self-referential as architects, thinking that through form and aesthetics we're going to engage these issues. I'm interested in that, obviously, as an architect, but I'm also interested in stealing, and I say that in Spanish, stealing, stealing, stealing the knowledge of the developer. Because it, there is an incredible creative uh, uh, process by which developers have been able to manipulate time and resources without investing that much and uh, by really amplifying margins of profit and so on. How do we understand these protocols so that the two uh, uh, ladies who rent a three-bedroom apartment and transform it illegally into a nursery and that can be represented by a non-profit organization in this neighborhood into their social service agenda that can again rechannel uh, uh, funding streams to support those activities and so on. The many stories in these neighborhoods, uh, the food uh, producers who use their houses to engage their small businesses, uh, the two script writers who in fact dreamed in having a black box theater, uh, etc. I'm talking about can we as architects become the representatives of those uh, conditions by enabling the knowledge that is out there and very seldom capitalized in funding and supporting many of these uh, transversal uh, socioeconomic activity. And obviously, the nonprofits that bundle these uh, 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 conditions begin to suggest that, in fact, the economic performa itself, if we were to really understand, and understand it as a site of intervention, could become a way of constructing community. This is one of the recently, one of the most, in my mind, provocative for myself uh, mani mini manifestos. Uh, can the economic spreadsheet of the developer become an instrument to construct community? as it engages and includes the social economy of housing uh, and obviously transforms the neighborhood into a political unit. This is one piece of the design process in the last years that was, has been essential and often misunderstood about my practice because we have not been engaging in building that much. The projects that we began to fight for 10 years ago finally are coming to fruition as we have redefined the zoning in this neighborhood and as we have produced a very different performa. Uh, this idea really became uh, obvious by uh, not only the rethinking of ownership, but the rethinking of zoning. Uh, have you uh, stopped to think, in fact, that zoning has been perpetuated as a punitive tool that prevents socialization, when in reality, I imagine, or maybe romantically uh, think, that zoning from its inception was maybe thought differently as a generative tool that could organize activity. That's the reason in many courses that I teach in the art school where I teach, I, uh, in the, de the designing of zoning or the designing of policy is an incredible conceptual tool. How do we anticipate activity, uh, economy, through more intelligent zoning? A lot of people think that I am trying to, because I uh, study shanty towns, that I, in fact, do not care about zoning. I, obviously, what I'm arguing is 
uh, for a more intelligent zoning. I, I think that the zoning, obviously, that we uh, adopt sometimes tends to be hugely exclusionary. Um, so the new uh, conditions of zoning at the scale of neighborhoods and communities uh, can begin to also uh, suggest uh, that we as architects can, uh, can design new forms of governance at the scale of communities. The designing again of political and economic processes. And this is the micro policy that I mentioned we designed a few years ago with Casa Familiar, which is this non profit community based agency in San Isidro, where we proposed that, in fact, this mediating agency as a Buddhist temple could begin to uh, negotiate the transformation of zoning for its own environment uh, by documenting and mapping physically the encroachment, in other words, the alterations of many of those parcels. We proposed to the municipality of San Diego that the nonprofit would become a think tank that would again document all the illegal additions and businesses in that neighborhood. Uh, the relationship to architects and the schools of architecture is important here because we are talking about new systems of communication. What is density was an incredible moment in a workshop that we organized. I, I am rushing through this. This is probably one of the areas that I would like to really expand a little more, that in order to make these projects happen, we had to design the workshops themselves in this community that up to now had been co-opted by uh, very strange traditions of uh, participatory, how would I call it, uh, uh, advocacy planning. We're, we're only looking at the caricatures of culture as a way of defining the identity of neighborhoods that a Hispanic uh, Mexican-American culture had to dress its buildings with Aztec temples and murals and we were not paying attention at all to the informal economies and densities that were already happening. The negotiation of people with boundaries and resources could be a more uh, important instrument in rethinking urbanization. So that uh, really took, we had to design games, we had to design communicational systems to co-produce uh, many of these notions, which I, again, wish I could tell you a little more, but um, it's important just to suggest the process to you. Uh, obviously, the engagement of the municipality uh, was important in, in, in really pushing this agenda. Uh, the nonprofit then uh, uh, proposes to be an informal city hall, uh, facilitating information, uh, prepackaging uh, permits in order to replace the older additions that were not safe into new ones, uh, and engaging into social contracts with those property owners who, while they own the parcel, they did not have the resources to develop it. Uh, so the idea of co-development between the non-profit and the owners so to prevent gentrification, a kind of social contractual agreement that engages them as co-producers and co-managers of these resources was an important aspect. Aspect. Uh, and obviously, the last part of it was the prepackaging not only of permits but of tax cre uh, credit based subsidy systems. For a developer to make it uh, affordable to build uh, an affordable housing project, let's say, as you know, a developer would have to take advantage of tax credits. And because of tax credit faulty legislation at times that do, does not benefit communities but just large developments, uh, these uh, projects would have to be at least 50 units in density. So the idea here was to present a model by which the 50 units of a tax credit based subsidy of a developer could be shattered into 50 small pieces as long as the nonprofit could manage it and could represent it. Uh, in, in that sense, again, the prepackaging of tax credit based uh, uh, lending in order to support small scale development. Um, there is so much to say about this part, you know, because uh, as new urbanists uh, continue to be enamored with the idea of style and form as the kind of devices to rethink the city and only end up uh, somehow beautifying uh, and altering suburbanization just slightly without understanding or engaging issues of inequality. Uh, they never stop to think that the older neighborhoods that we adore so much because they are made of, uh, 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 how would you call it, uh, English uh, Tudor or picket fences or whatever, that those neighborhoods, what makes them beautiful is that they were made of duplexes and fourplexes in many of those environments in the city. That there was at some point in the history of this country a, a, an alliance of zoning and lending that benefited the small guy or the small community uh, to produce a sustainable uh, uh, condition by renting a unit 
and, and in terms of an owner-occupied loan. It's a longer story. What I'm trying to say is that we need to go back to that valley because it was then where it was a different idea and a scale of development engaging what I would aspire to be more a, a more faithful representation of the American dream, not about the large but about the small embedded in these communities. Again, uh, probably I'm already uh, uh, boring you too much with these uh, yellow slides, but uh, I'm trying to suggest that in pair, uh, pair to all this need to rethink the language, the political language, we need new sources of political representation and public participation uh, to uh, co-manage the processes again, uh, uh, obviously of development rethinking the community's role in co-producing housing. Uh, this small, uh, mi this micro-policy begins to now descend into the specificity of the parcel in, in terms of an architectural prototype. Even though I've been engaged in other sites and other projects, uh, this one has become paradigmatic in the last years. The transformation of small parcels in this neighborhood of San Isidro, next to the checkpoint, into micro socioeconomic systems, just like the Buddhist temple site, right? That from a house it became a more complex socioeconomic and cultural system. Uh, so, in a small parcel in this uh, neighborhood of San Isidro, the nonprofit begins to acquire land, begins to transform from a social service provider into a developer of affordable housing, buys this church uh, that we are retrofitting into an incubator uh, of uh, social programming and economic programming in collaboration with artists, uh, I believe very much in this idea of incubating the neighborhood, incubating others as a point of departure. A in a sliver of property next to it, uh, the construction of these small open air social rooms, which we call living, living rooms at the border, equipped with electricity and collective kitchens that organize somehow the entrepreneurial energies of informal markets in alleys, uh, and providing again the support systems such as these kitchens that become the seed uh, for the teaching through these social rooms of housing prototypes, which is the one uh, flanking the parcel, uh, a small and long uh, a housing uh, prototype that serves uh, uh, single mothers with, with children. And one idea here was that the residents of this uh, housing would become uh, co-managers of the programming and co-producers of the programming that is injected into those social rooms across time with the nonprofit organization and with artists. So the second typology was a duplex that in the pro forma itself was to be conceived as a way of exchanging rent for social service as a couple of uh, social practice artists uh, would occupy the space in order to assure the collaborations. I'm talking about getting very specific about the calibration uh, of programming and relationships across these uh, resources and people. And to the other end of the parcel, large units uh, with uh, kitchens, large kitchens, shared kitchens for large families who live with grandmothers uh, that can also partner with the nonprofit uh, uh, to enable the use of those kitchens for uh, small businesses. And finally, the last sliver, which is built by the community itself, because this has, these are accessory buildings that if, depending on the size, they don't need a permit and they can really be incentivized by enabling local uh, labor, let's say. So what I'm trying to suggest is that in this pixelation of a small parcel with different housing economies, different uh, types of uh, social demographics in terms of activity, we begin to produce a little bit of a salsa uh, to, to engage a kind of uh, productivity and, uh, in terms of social and economic uh, complexity. Obviously, another aspect here is that housing in many of these marginal neighborhoods cannot exist uh, on its own as just units. This has been part of the problem uh, that we think that housing, in order to solve it, we just pack them into buildings uh, flanking double-loaded corridors, when in reality, uh, housing in this case is embedded instead in a, a small infrastructure of social service, pedagogical and cultural uh, and social programming. The idea, again, 
almost like Tijuana, that social infrastructure can occur at the scale of parcels. So when this small scale development organized by these slivers of circulation uh, connecting alleys to streets, but also uh, the careful calibration of programming in the interstitial spaces, almost as if the buildings talk to each other, uh, you know, and collaborated in terms of programming. Uh, this has been an essential uh, principle in my mind as I've been witnessing how these nonprofit organizations work, is that these projects need to be curated in a sense. The curatorial agency that is necessary to anticipate, nurture, and maintain, in terms of a long term, the sustainability of those socioeconomic relations. Uh, this is an important aspect, obviously, in the interrelation of people, spaces, programs, and resources. This is what I would call the possibility of democratizing urban development. Other points of access. Because after all, what has really been at stake in the last years is the dramatic homogenization of the city with the same performa from New York uh, to San Diego. So uh, other forms of economy, other forms of zoning. Uh, if I can, uh, obviously, if I can uh, uh, give you the last couple of stories, and, and you can maybe help me, you know, like stretch or something, because I don't want to, I am taking advantage of you. I decided to give you the Hannah Blom version. Uh, uh, but I want to make a case here that while the, in, the interest has been on the specific and the small, and from there, out of that specificity, begin to zoom out, right? Begin to understand more clearly the issues at broad and global scales. So can we for a moment imagine that from the specificity of the conditions embedded in these neighborhoods, we can begin to reimagine the region. Every single image I showed you in the last almost hour came from these two neighborhoods. And you can see faintly the border between them. To the north, San Isidro. To the south, an 85,000 people slum that crashes against, against the wall. Uh, part of, the, again, the message or the possibility in the last years has been, can we imagine an urbanization made of neighborhoods? Or an urbanization really driven by an, uh, an, uh, an imagination, let's say, uh, that is inspired and motivated and provoked by the specificity of those conflicts. Here's where I began to realize conceptually that I needed to really engage the world, obviously, that the whole excuse to enter the specificity of this place was to comment on other global dynamics. I discovered that the San Diego-Tijuana border checkpoint is in the same global corridor between the 28th and 33 degrees north parallel, connecting itself with some of the most intensive checkpoints in the world, inclu including the Strait of Gibraltar, the main funnel of migration from North Africa into Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border. I actually added even China, which in fact, as a whole kind of system, I began to realize had depended in the last years on urbanities of labor and surveillance as well. Uh, then I began to be interested in uh, how this coincided with the post 9-11 Pentagon's new map uh, where the Pentagon subdivided after 9-11 the world's cartography between what they call the non-integrating gap, which is really the dysfunctional families of the global south, from which terrorism might be harbored, and from which an unprecedented flow of migration goes in search for the strong economies, particularly of the northern hemisphere, the functioning core. But I began to realize as well that the centers of manufacture in, manufacture in many American in, in, in cities and Europe had displaced themselves, searching for the cheap labor markets of the global south or the non-integrating gap in this transference of people going in one direction and goods and services going in the other, we begin to produce again the same resonance that I was finding at the local. The need to problematize, the need to problematize our categories of the global uh, and the local. And then obviously later, or uh, recently I should say, as the Spring Revolution is somewhere here, uh, I began also to juxtapose this with the climatic equator, uh, which really revealed a very strange image. Just like Michael Sorkin once said, I hope he said that the new green, the green, as we are all fascinated with greenness today, that the green is our new red, he said. That there needs to be a kind of social dimension to sustainability, but uh, in this juxtaposition became really the framework for my practice that was really powerful, echoing, in a sense, obviously, a whole tradition of thinkers, such as Bob Minister Fuller, who at some point reminded us that any conversation in terms of the future of civilization of the world 
could, could not begin without uh, uh, reflecting on the conflicts between ge geopolitical borders, natural resources, and marginal communities. I think that kind of uh, interrelation is an important one. So I began to uh, uh, produce a series of meetings at the border, uh, putting my hat, uh, how would I say it, as a curator. Uh, uh, I really en enjoy being a kind of curator of, uh, an, an enabler of, of conversations. So I decided to produce a series of uh, meetings that would look uh, more broadly at the regional dimension. Uh, Obviously, this is the watershed systems that flank the border between the Mexico and the United States that are divided by that geopolitical border. Imagine that all these natural systems mismanaged by a very poor uh, relationship of collaboration between these two nations. And as we begin to zoom into the territory, we begin to get back to the neighborhoods that I introduced you to today. This is the Tijuana River watershed system. Uh, which is, in fact, 75% uh, of it is in uh, Mexico and 25% uh, uh, in San Diego. is truncated by the border itself. And these are, again, the two neighborhoods that I introduced you earlier, San Isidro, the checkpoint, and the slum of 85,000 people, the border. Uh, this is the, this shanty town. In both neighborhoods flank an estuary. Remember in the first image I showed you today where the Tijuana River enters into, uh, towards the Pacific Ocean. And this estuary now being undermined as we then zoom further into the specificity of the territory by the militarization of that environment as homeland security. This is the slum uh, and this is the micro, this is the basins that are built by Homeland Security to contain many of the, the, the sort of the pollution coming from the, the slum into the estuary. Uh, here's the photo of that slum crashing against the wall and on the other side, the estuary. Uh, and it is this zone that Homeland Security claimed after 9-11 uh, with uh, security and so doing began to build infrastructure of surveillance, damming all the canyons that cross the border, compromising the functionality of the, of the watershed system, uh, and amplifying and dramatizing the flow of waste from this shanty town into the estuary. So this is the waste that is coming now back to San Diego. Isn't that ironic? The waste that is important to Tijuana is now filtering back into the environmental zone after uh, Homeland Security began to build those uh, dams. Uh, so we decided to, and I decided to curate an event in the midst of these forces, in the, con the context of, again, collision of these forces. Uh, these are uh, meetings that uh, basically uh, have as a premise to displace ourselves from the centrality of the institution and bring the public, the politicians, the activists, and the communities to engage into a critical conversation, not in the institution, but in the context of the geographies of conflict themselves. So we process a, a special permit uh, that took us a year with Homeland Security to, in fact, let us uh, set a tent right in that location inside the jurisdiction to have a series of conversations with many of these stakeholders uh, that came from all over the world uh, to engage into this, the discussion of this uh, very site. Uh, and after those discussions, uh, again, we negotiated a permit to produce a public action to cross the border exactly at this point in an unprecedented way. Uh, through a new drain that Homeland Security has just recently built. And so here is where the uh, 300 and plus people who came uh, to the event uh, begins, we begin to walk towards this uh, militarized uh, uh, wall. Again, the idea is that the, the drain itself was transformed into a 24 hour official port of entry from the United States into Mexico. Uh, so everybody had to have their passports to cross. As Homeland Security is saying goodbye to us uh, here, this is a new wall built, it's huge infrastructure damming the canyons. Uh, I, I'm here crossing the border through the drain uh, in an um, again unprecedented way. And in the south end of the, uh, the drain, uh, home, uh, Mexican immigration is waiting for us to stamp our passports. Uh, and as they stamp our passports, you see the flow of waste going from the slum into the estuary. It was at that very moment in that performative act of revealing physically, again, the kind of 
collisions of these uh, ecologies where again a new conversation can begin to take uh, place. One of the most important figures that crossed the border with us there was the former mayor of Medellin, Sergio Fajardo, who ended up giving uh, his, his presentation in the slum on the other side. Um, so it is in this uh, agonistic model, if I can say this, uh, I, I would like to explain that at some point, of negotiation uh, across the institutions of power again to expose the, the matters of concern and to understand how we can negotiate a new type of conversation, uh, to intervene into the debate itself, basically. Uh, this is something that has been essential uh, to redefine our conditions of, again, sustainability and citizenship. Uh, Obviously, what I'm talking about is something that I learned so much from Chantal Mouffe, the political philosopher, who suggested that our notion of the public needed to begin to transform, uh, that the public was not just a beautified, manicured space, that the public space, in fact, is a battleground uh, where the power, the political and econ economic power of institutions is confronted, exposed, visualized, in order to engage into a new type of conversation, less polarizing, uh, even though she suggests that the political depends on levels of antagonism, but she uh, forwards a notion that has been emancipatory for me, is this notion of agonism, which really implies, again, a, a kind of way of negotiating and summoning the stakeholders, let's say, the kind of actors, institutional and otherwise, that have, uh, been, uh, um, that have had a role in producing the crisis in the first place. I had a final a story to tell you, but I think I already uh, said enough, uh, and I really thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we do have time for maybe, you know, a couple questions. Um, if you have a question for Mr. Cruz, just please raise your hand and I'll stumble over with the microphone. Okay, this guy's trouble, so you've got to look yes. out for him. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mahdi Saad, uh, third year architecture student here at Lawrence. Just the question I have is you spoke uh, a lot about uh, when designing to consider, you know, public and political uh, tension and ties and things going on, but how do you design for an environment where it's constantly changing where politically it's changing whether it be like uh, territories and uh, who, who exactly owns that land and what if that's an area where it's changing a lot or where the water is changing a lot where water flow say for example mm -hmm. you were to get some mass changes in the way the water comes through yeah. how do you design for 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 those changes for for the long run you know because uh, you could have certain environments there, or certain like uh, certain civilizations, certain places where it's lower class that may change in a few years based on the natural resources in the area. How do you design yeah. for that? Yeah, no, it's you know it's a fundamental question, uh, which might pertain to another way of asking of the informal uh, in terms of how the informal dynamics, let's say, in the specificity of these interventions at small scales, how can it begin to trickle up? How, how, how does it begin to uh, scale up into other, you know? I'm saying this because many times when I present the work, I'm always seen with suspicion uh, because this is not really talking about these large scale interventions as we have been so obsessed with largeness uh, and so on. I decided at some point to begin small in these neighborhoods. Uh, even though in those days, you know, some of my Dutch friends would tell me, why, why aren't you really aspiring to more broad political transformations? But they didn't understand that in the United States it's impossible, obviously, to engage that, even though that's what we should all aspire for, structural kind of transformations of the political. But uh, for me, it made more sense to begin small in this uh, environment so I could begin to uh, engage more strategically these other scales. But what I was trying to say is that the question that always comes after that, uh, mainly by critics, is that how does this scale up? Uh, and I began to realize that maybe it doesn't have to scale up for a moment, uh, that is maybe about this sort of um, threading of different modalities of governance at smaller environments and scales that then negotiate their own coexistence. In other words, how do we negotiate the relationship between 
uh, and I could say the ethical uh, the relationship between individuals, collectives, and institutions, uh, meaning collective interests and individual ones. I mean, this is uh, something that is at stake today here in this country. Again, what I'm trying to say is, can there be a model by which still the self-assurance of top-down policy that must be necessary to prevent, uh, obviously, uh, certain injustices, but with the agility uh, uh, to enable communities to also participate in the, uh, in the construction of their own uh, immediate and more particular logics of organization. I don't want to get into this. I've been re questioning, I've been reflecting a lot about this because of friends in Switzerland who really amplify that the model of Switzerland in terms of the cantons is something that really is one of the examples of this sort of correlation of scales. Anyway, the point is this, in answering more directly, it's not, not, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, in that agility, you would have to engage the very dynamics of those transformations. One thing that I didn't mention in Tijuana and the slums in terms of many procedures that I've been learning and discovering and, and formulating, is that in those slums, obviously, uh, when they are invaded by people illegally, people begin a process by which government gives them property titles, uh, which is very unique in the world. As that process is happening, the canyon is subdivided into the typical jurisdictional zones to administer uh, those uh, processes. When you begin to realize in the way that, again, people settle in the canyon by engaging the topography lightly at times, illegally, and uh, in, in, in complicated ways at times, that there is a more interesting relationship to the natural boundaries. In essence, what I'm saying is, what I began to realize is that the jurisdictional and the natural uh, come into conflict. That the way that we impose um, I'm getting, I'm, I'm making, I will make sense in a moment. The, the, the way we impose jurisdictional power in a territory does not take into account the natural boundaries. Obviously, the border itself is a mama of all that, right? And so, I be, with the activists that I work in this country, we began to realize, can, in fact, not the administrative, but the natural boundaries be a way of constructing a neighborhood? So the, the, the lines that are red of the jurisdictional and the blue of the water were at odds with one another. That opened up a very interesting process with the activists that they began to suggest that that canyon could have its own watersh watershed council. Because the watershed council at the scale of the state is what governs every canyon in Baja California. And we began to realize that the community inside this watershed piece could be in charge of really managing its own economic and natural resources. That meant that that became a little pixel in the, in the context of other canyons. So that's what I was trying to say is that they now are in more, in a position to more intelligently manage the fluidity and transformation of their own conditions by enabling the construction of more specific policies, less driven by the abstraction of the top down. But managed at some point by the top down in understanding that at some point somebody has to also curate the relationship of these pixels. It's a complicated thing. What I'm trying to say is the interpretation of the top down and the bottom up is at stake. Is there another question? I promise not to answer with such a long answer, but it's just that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex one. Yeah. Oh, yep. Oh. Jim, and, and then we'll finish up with Amy. You, you talked a lot about uh, public space, and one of the things that, that I think about a lot when these issues come up is what I feel like, in, particularly in the United States, is almost an urban illiteracy, and it, maybe even an illiteracy to what public space is. And I don't think that that's as prevalent in the larger cities as that I, I do in the smaller towns and the community. So in many cases, uh, I'm not sure that people can decipher between the park bench in Walmart and the park bench in a public park. You know, they don't realize that when they're in private space or corporate owned space that they're not in public space. You know, that there is this illiteracy of understanding or at least a, not an awareness of it. And how does that maybe play into to some of your work when, when speaking to people or does it? I mean, I think it's perfectly appropriate that the skaters were the ones that that brought this out because they know what is public and private because they get thrown out 
if it's private. So yes. they're hyper aware of it. Yes. Right. Whereas I'm not sure a lot of people are. You know, the, now the problem is that the, large, the last story I had is exactly dealing with this issue. But <laughs> I mean, I, I can. I, you are. Are you okay with it? I mean, it's like. I, can, is that okay? Are you sure? It's, no, it's, it's, it's just that because I, I really, I think that it would be nice to. I don't want to completely hijack. Oops. I don't want to hijack. Look at that 488 slides. Whoever said that one slide per second is wrong, <laughs> or, 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 per, or per minute, what is it? Per, per minute. Uh, no, let, 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 uh, let, let, me, let me just respond to that question through the, through the images very quickly. Uh, uh, it's a project about public space in, in Korea, in South Korea. Uh, I was invited. The good thing about teaching in an art school is that, you know, I also am invited to art sort of you know, projects that intervene into public space. Uh, and as I came to Korea, I called this project uh, Conversations on Coexistence following my experience with the political equator. And so here I was in the uh, mayor's office of this satellite city to Seoul called Anyan. And we are in the 23rd floor, whatever, of the municipality. And as I'm looking, I'm talking to the curator of the project, Kion Park, in fact, uh, who, uh, as I'm looking out into the city, I see these small houses. Uh, reminding me a lot of California, right, in this sort of spread it through the landscape. But when I get close to the window, I see that these houses are just the, the, top, uh, the top piece of, of, of actually a, a, a hugely kind of, again, uh, homogenizing uh, towers that is a typical kind of paradigm in many Asian cities. Uh, in fact, I began to realize that the conflict that I, I usually, again, as I mentioned, try to open the question about really places where there is this uh, collision uh, across institutions uh, uh, manifested physically in the city. So the conflict between the new projects, as they are called, the, the homogeneous vertical towers of housing, and the older neighborhoods. As you know, many of these neighborhoods are being demolished uh, in, uh, in these environments. So I immediately uh, realized that because this neighborhood was going to be demolished in the next five years to build this, uh, I began to realize, obviously, that it is uh, the conflict between the vertical and the horizontal what needed to be opened up. I think that very seldom we f have found actual compelling projects that negotiate that uh, in terms of density. Uh, so then I began to realize that I wanted to really enter into those neighborhoods. We proposed to engage the public in a project which I could call loosely a kind of, which I'm getting at your question, a kind of urban pedagogical model. Uh, how do we raise awareness? about the, the specificity of these policies, these issues. Uh, and even though these neighborhoods are in fact uh, led by very activi activist uh, uh, minds in, in Korea, I began to realize that many of the activists lack the uh, uh, political language in the end that could really amplify to the developers and the government uh, the role, the value of the social uh, spaces and the economic the informal economy is embedded in this neighborhood. So we be, I began to realize that, again, I wanted to intervene into that debate. So we proposed to build models of the neighborhoods that were going to be demolished in the next five years. So it's models as mediating tools. And I enlisted uh, activists, uh, uh, elementary school children, and engineer students from the engineering school in Korea, because the architects wanted to do the models in basswood. I said, I, I really wanted to make it really lyrical, very dramatic, very real, uh, to really depict the constitution of these spaces. We set up, this is an eight-month project, by the way, on the streets to document these environments, to make an account of the most compelling informal economies and spaces that were socially intensive. And as we were building the models, we were talking to a variety of stakeholders, primarily with the activists, who went to the municipality with their pancarts to occupy uh, and to really demand some kind of change, but without the political language to really propose uh, uh, out of the intelligence of their own performative neighborhood, uh, other models of urbanization. Uh, so we began to, as we are circulating these models, we were also uh, producing workshops uh, that uh, documented and at times lyrically uh, visualize uh, the kinds of uh, processes ultimately that, uh, that happen in the transformation and the kind of demolition of these environments uh, into that. I mean, the very, 
and that uh, begins to open up in the community. I mean, we're talking about activists uh, who uh, are working on the ground, and sometimes because they are working in the trenches, they lack the critical consciousness of understanding that that process could be a viable device. Uh, this man who had in four rooftops a snail farm, uh, in the neighborhood and who had also organized his block into a cooperative that was really essential to ma maintaining an economy. An amazing array of really amazing projects uh, dealing with informal economies, uh, urban agriculture, uh, very, very interesting. So the documentation of all of that and forwarding this notion again that it is the operative dimension of participation, what really, in a sense, is at stake in you know, amplifying other ideas of, of the public. We circulated the models, uh, went to the designers of the new towers, uh, the mayor's office and the developers, uh, and the Catholic Church, which is in fact, uh, uh, I was thinking of Gilbert, you know, so is the, is the, in fact, is the epicenter of resistance towards this development and, and where many of the activists meet. And, and so in this circulation uh, a, of uh, the models through the city, we began to think again of the necessary designing of, of protocols, of new protocols, um, as we intervene in the debate. The project yielded as an art project, which was always problematic, a kind of bill of rights for the neighborhoods uh, that really were so similar, in fact, to the FDR new, uh, uh, bill of rights here. I mean, it, o almost uh, uh, coincidentally, in terms of, again, the right of a community to develop at different speeds of growth and to manage its own modes of production, many other things, uh, and so on. Uh, but again, to finish the, the issue of the question is, uh, I realized that part of the problem in today's uh, fragmentation of urban policy and public participation is a crisis of knowledge transfer. Uh, the transfer of uh, uh, the corridors of knowledge exchange uh, between, again, the specialized knowledge of institutions and in a way the creative knowledge, knowledge of communities. This is what happened in Latin America in the last decade. Uh, as you remember in the 70s in Porto Alegre, where the participatory budgets, where a mayor from Porto Alegre decides to produce a policy that includes the communities in the redistribution of municipal budgets. And that trickles up into Curitiba, Brazil, where the idea of public space begins to be paired uh, with a, a project of eco-literacy, making aware, uh, uh, producing awareness in, in many sectors of the population, which in fact culminates in, in Bogota a bit with Antanas Mocus, the mayor of Bogota, the famous mayor of Bogota, who uh, propelled the transformation of the city by investing in civic education, civic culture, urban pedagogy as a foundation uh, to rethink infrastructure. And now the project that I'm engaging recently is in Medellin, Colombia, where that took uh, even another turn in more co complicated and beautiful ways, where public space, they conceived it as a space that educates and so many of the alterations in many of the shanty towns in Medellin in order to fight violence, they produce what they are called the library parks. This might not be a good example of a building necessarily, but what I'm trying to say is that no other place in the world, a government at municipal scales invested in unprecedented ways in the most marginal, uh, poor, poorest areas of the city in order to fight violence, ignorance, and economic inequality. So the idea of public space that is plugged with education and support systems. So that's, that's definitely at the, at the core, again, of uh, what you're saying. It's, it's a need to invest, and that's probably is a good way of ending because as I see my practice in the next five years, I want to invest a lot in uh, entering into that gap, uh, again, between uh, public imagination and public policy. Uh, I'm interested in communicational, pedagogical models that can enter into the debate of the public. Thank you. Sure.